Father in heaven, we thank you so much for an opportunity to be together and, and consider your will and ask for your will to be done and made known. And as we think about our media use and these tools, also these dangers and pitfalls in our lives, we just pray for wisdom. We ask for your discernment and please help us to set aside our opinions, our preferences and what we like and the speaker's opinion and any, any ideas that might conflict with your divine will. We just ask for you to speak. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, the year was 1844 and students of the Bible know from... Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, that 1844 was a pivotal year. In fact, it was the most monumental prophetic year since the first coming of Christ. 1844, the beginning of the antitypical day of atonement, the time of the judgment had begun. Praise God for these last days in which we live. We know that year to be important prophetically, but what a lot of people don't know about the history is something else happened in 1844. Samuel Morse, inventor of the telegraph, text messaged from Washington, D.C., the words, What hath God wrought? Numbers 23, verse 23. Yes, it was the telegraph, but it was the world's first text message. It was the birth of modern media and telecommunications. Most people, when they think of the birth of modern media, they go back to the television or maybe the radio. But 1844, the hinge point in prophetic history, is also the birth and the launching forth of tools that we can use to spread the three angels' messages, to spread the everlasting gospel, to bring a knowledge of the truth, and then the end shall come. Now these tools, we're going to talk about the dangers, believe me, that's what I do full time and how we need to find balance. But first of all, we can praise God for technology. Right here on this device, I have an entire library of books that's 200,000 pages long. It would be a whole bookshelf here, and it would be Spirit of Prophecy writings that if I were to take it on a hand cart, you know, I'd need multiple stacks of books to be able to get it anywhere, but I carry it with me in my pocket when I travel to speak at churches. Praise God for even social media with its dangers that we're going to talk about. You can get the word out in ways that you couldn't before. We had a family friend who was sick and the, the, the little boy just about died. Prayer went out and thousands of people heard about this and were praying for this little kid and miracles happened. Praise God for that, right? If you get on a Google search engine or any search engine right now, if you Google the word Sabbath, you get the Bible truth about the fourth commandment on a website, sabbathtruth.com. That's an amazing facts website. Very top of the search engine, right after the Wikipedia page. So there, I mean, we could go on and on and on with the positive benefits, but does the devil know that it is the last days? Does he know the prophecies? He knows here we are, and God's remnant people are pressing forward the message. He wants to use these very tools, what hath God wrought, that God is the designer and inventor of all of human capacity to invent. And Satan wants to take that, co-opt it, twist it, distort it, and use media to destroy rather than to allow people to spread those truths and have more efficiencies and productivities and conveniences in our lives that we so appreciate with modern media. Being able to use a platform like video recordings like this. Our ministries uh, seminars are up on satellite networks. We have DVDs at beltoftruthministries.org. All of the different methods you can use. Praise God for them. But let's consider the dangers because you fast forward now to the year 2000. 2018. How many minutes of media is the average American consuming per day? Look at this, 666 minutes of media per day. <laughs> Speaking of prophecies, you know that from Revelation 13. This is not a fulfillment of prophecy, so to speak, but in a way, it is a concern when we see a vastly large number like that and kind of an ominous sounding prophetic number with beastly um, associations. 666 minutes per day for the average American. Teens now consume nine hours of entertainment media per day. When you look at this chart, look at the dark blue. In 2014, 24% of teens said that they were almost constantly on their phone. Fast forward to 2018, and almost half of teenagers today, 45%, almost half of teenagers today say they are almost constantly on their devices. That is a whole new reality, a whole new level, which absolutely made me laugh when I read the CNN article that said, by the numbers, kids are not spending more time with screens than they were in the 80s. Now, hold on just a second. Let's think about that. Anybody remember the 80s? Compare it to today. Has screen time risen? Yeah. You can actually look at studies on this. I looked at one by uh, Twenge and Spitzberg. 
Pittsburgh and, and Martin at Uni San Diego State University. Printed it out. I'm sitting there on an airplane right after I looked at this article, looking at all the data and how there's been a drastic rise over the decades. Specifically, in the 1980s, the average teenager was doing three and a half hours of screen time and entertainment media per day. Fast forward to 2007, and it was up to five hours per day. And then just between the years of 2007 and 2016, it rose from five hours to nine hours. So it's nearly doubled just in that decade, and it's nearly tripled since the 80s. Kids are not spending more time with screens now than they were in the 80s? Boy, oh boy, that's what the media would have you believe. I think we can say the media mind, if we become so, so immersed in this, in this mainstream media mind manipulation, the media mind becomes deceivable. But the mind of Christ, critically thinking, doesn't the Bible say, come let us reason together, saith the Lord. This series, the Media Mind series, is actually five parts. And the fifth part, I'm not going to be able to touch on in this overview session. And it's like, ah, oh, it's heart-wrenching to me to figure out, you know, what to include in the overview. But it's called People of the Book in the Age of the App. And you want to watch that one. It's maybe my favorite of all five, but I couldn't really get bits and pieces of it because you got to see the whole thing. And it talks about being thinkers, not mere reflectors of other men's thoughts and what media is doing, modern media, including so much social media and video games and all of it, even smartphone use when it's ubiquitous and ever-present, it becomes a thing that is dumbing us down and, 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 and causing a lot of problems that I won't get into right now because I said I'm not going to do disc five right now. We've got to keep moving so we can hit the highlights of, of, some of the first, some of the highlights of the first four DVDs, which, by the way, the first one is called How to Be Human Again. You won't want to miss that one. The second one we'll get a little bit of also, The Disconnected Childhood talking about how children are disconnected from nature, from parents, from labor, from play, from all of the ways that we've seen children develop and help them develop through their lives in the past. The disconnected childhood, they're disconnected from, from normal childhood because they're connected to devices, but we can, it's a double entendre, we can help children become disconnected from constant media use and rediscover what it means to be human again, what it means to have a childhood again. And then the third session is anti-social media. It's about social media and how anti-social actually it may be for many people. And then very important session number four, it's hard to rank these as which one's the more, most important, probably the disconnected childhood is my favorite. This one is hugely important, it's called digital pharmacia number four, digital pharmacia, where we look at the addictive nature of these technologies. But let's go right back to the stats. Parents are spending eight hours a day on entertainment media, so it would be a little hypocritical for us to say, oh, teens these days, and then adults and parents are spending nearly eight hours per day on the very same types of entertainment and social media as the teenagers are. If we're doing media for work and other purposes, that's an addition to this eight to eight hours per day. The average adult spends more time looking at screens than sleeping. The average American spends 65% of their waking hours consuming media. The average American now spends 4.7 hours on their smartphone per day and checks their phones 80 to 150 times per day and somehow still manages to watch four hours of television per day. Now don't do what, what many of us would be tempted to do compare ourselves with the, those numbers and then feel safe and secure as long as we're under the average. The Bible says, but they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. So it wouldn't be wise for us to go, okay, I'm safe as long as I'm beneath the average. God has a proper media balance for every person. Now when it comes to worldly media, the balance would be zero, <laughs> worldly media, and only that which is true and pure and noble and right and lovely. But when it comes to using technologies for, for, for productive purposes, for informational purposes, for spiritual purposes, we can even overdo that when it comes to our use of the internet and social media and phones, not for worldly things. I'm not talking about Hollywood entertainment and the music industry that's full of absolute demonic trash of the devil. That we want none of. But the right balance, the right number of minutes, hours, what times of the day, how much per day, at what ages, is going to be something each individual needs to pray about. And if you look through the whole series, the full five DVDs on the, the media mind, it, it, it'll give some suggestions, some information, some, some tips that I think will help give us uh, a, a good indication of where we need to be going on that. But I'm not going to lay down the prescription. This is what exactly what everybody needs to do. But the Lord has laid down the prescription from worldliness 
Come apart and be separate, saith the Lord. Touch no unclean thing. Now it starts from an early age, this media immersion. This, I could not believe what I was seeing. Take a look. Here's kids are doing just about everything earlier these days. Uh, we're going to show you some YouTube video here of a one-year-old who is happily and expertly playing with the I iPad. Apparently knowing just what to do. Then she tried a real magazine, brick and mortar magazine. She, <laughs> she's trying to pinch and move and swipe the, uh, the real magazine. Doesn't work quite the same way. <laughs> so on the one hand, that's a little cute and endearing and adorable, but on the other hand, that's really scary. Like, children don't understand the three-dimensional world. And it's not just children. Here's this, here's this guy. He looks like he's, whoa, he's not really going to walk into that manhole, is he? Oh, yeah, there he goes. Whoa. On his phone, oblivious, totally checked out. Uh, one more time, just so you can see, this really happened. I hope the guy's okay. Uh, we kind of laugh at it, but at the same time, the media mind is checked out. The mind of Christ, though, engaged. It's like we need to learn to be human again. You know what I mean by that? God created Adam and Eve, Genesis 1:27, in his image. He created us for a way to thrive, a way to live. In our labor, in our study, in our, in our enjoyment of nature, in, in the study of God's word, in our social relations, in our families, in the church body, in, in entrepreneurial endeavors, in ministry outlets, you name it. And in, in even artistic and musical, and yes, technological and media in its proper balance. God God has us a, a lifestyle for us to live where we can thrive and maximize our relationship with Jesus Christ, our relationships with one another, our development of our children and youth, and all of us becoming to this full measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ and being transformed by the renewing of our minds. That's redemption. The image of God in man being restored, where we are not immersed and living in a virtual place any longer, but we are finding that experience with Jesus that he has designed for us. Today, however, the average person is touching, tapping, swiping, pinching their device, their phone, 2,617 times per day. Individual touches and taps. 2,617 times per day, times 365 days in a year. That's nearly a million times we are touching these things. Now, add up all the times that we touch our, our, our children, our pets, you know, wood and nails, soil and plants. Add all that up, it doesn't even combine to the sum total of the number of times we're touching things here in the virtual place, thinking about learning to be human again. How about living in God's reality and enjoying nature and enjoying each other? We'll get into all that, but one thing I want to start with is one of the real insidious factors about media, and that's when we use it at night. It used to be that the fireside and the candles provided the light that signaled to the brain, produced melatonin. It's going to be time to sleep because that type of light and the setting sun, that type of light is signal to, signaling to us to get good, long, restful sleep where we sleep deeply. But here we are with the media, with blue light suppressing melatonin production in our brain and kids who use media in the hour before bed are two times more likely to be sleepy the next day. Teenagers are, should be getting nine hours of sleep per night. They're getting on average under seven. So it's like we're missing out on God's thing where he goes, I want to give my beloved sleep in Psalm 127. God giveth his beloved sleep. In Proverbs 3, thou shalt lie down and thy sleep shall be sweet. But here we're doing so much entertainment and we think we're going to cheat that and have fun doing it, but teenagers are now sleeping with their pillow, either in hand or at hand, ready to wake them up many times under their pillow on, and they, half of them are waking up in the middle of the night at some point to do something on their phone other than just check the time. So, and it's not just teens, by the way, adults too, 95% of us are using devices in the hour before bed, 87% of us are going to bed with and waking up with our phone, and we're on our phone within 15 minutes of waking up in the morning. The media mind just then becomes tired. The mind of Christ, though, energized. And again, it's not just kids. Parents used to have a work day. Remember when you have the work day, and then you know, just do some shopping in the late afternoon or evening or whatever, and then you'd have evenings together. There was such a thing as the work day. Well, today, Shopping happens on Amazon all evening and into the hours of the night. And work is there at every ever-present thing. And so the evenings are not protected like they once were. Listen to this counsel, wise counsel. As a rule, the labor of the day should not be prolonged into the evening. Let parents devote the evenings to their families. Lay off care and perplexity with the labors of the day. Let the evenings be spent as happily as possible. 
Form a home reading circle in which every member of the family shall lay aside the busy cares of the day and unite in study. So it's not, it's not just that we are tired, but we are stressed out. We're working all into the evening hours, and then that disrupts our sleep, further disrupts the next day. And God's like, I have an injunction for you. Make your evenings as happy as possible. That's good. That's a good command to hear from the Lord. Have fun. Enjoy your family. Be a family. Have a good evening together. Another factor about media that began to perplex me was when I saw this. You now have a shorter attention span than a goldfish. Yes, the average human attention span in the industrialized world is now a full eight seconds. The goldfish clocks in at nine seconds, so they are superior to our attention span. Here we are as human beings, supposedly these, you know, endowed by God with incredible faculties, creatures, and our attention span has now been reduced to eight seconds? Well, what is it that's reducing our attention span? It's the media, of course. I mean, you could go, I have a whole section on this. I'll give you just a little bit. The commercials are shrinking. You can see the charts. They're getting everything quicker. The streaming is booming, and so songs are getting faster. Vocals in the 1980s. 80s used to come in after 23 seconds in the popular music songs of the worldly music industry. Today, the vocals start at five seconds. So there used to be an introduction. Now it's just like, boom, we got to get people's attention right away. The television shows and movies themselves are getting faster paced. They have to have a new image on the screen every two seconds on average now. People who have seen my Media on the Brain series, by the way, you can watch that at beltoftruth.tv and get, you can watch all our stuff there at beltoftruth.tv in a subscription-based system there. Wonderful website, very important to get, to get online there and look at all our stuff on parenting and raising the remnants, the true education uh, material, schooled and undoctrinated, uh, overcoming principles, overcoming lust, a series called A Greater Lust. Just, just go there and look at all, everything we've put out as a ministry, not just talking about media, but other things as well. Using media in a positive way, so that praise God for that, beltoftruth.tv. But um, the average, when I started Media on the Brain in 2012, it was every three seconds was the industry standard. They'd need to have a new image up on the screen in the movie or in the show, a camera angle, a scene change, something new grabbing your attention every three seconds on average. That's why it's shortening our attention span down to under a goldfish. Well, now it's every two seconds is the industry standard, and that's actually outdated information. It's probably even shorter now. So you name it. The, the, the entertainment, media, internet use, and all of this is shortening attention spans in this generation of all ages. Even social media use, social media is reducing attention span. They did a study of 2,000 adults, and they wanted to see what kind of attention spans they had, and then they asked them how much social media use they, they, they have on their daily basis. People who were heavier social media users had lower attention spans than people who were using very little or no social media. So we can sum that up with the media mind is distractible, but the mind of Christ attentive. You see, attention is important to God. You might say, well, what does attention span matter? This isn't that important as far as our spiritual lives go, but it is because I want to have a great attention span for the word of God for sermons, for spiritual things that require a little bit more of a sober reality than the fast-paced entertainment is throwing at us. Also, the Bible talks about take heed, take heed. Eighty times it says this in the Bible. Pay attention, listen. And when we listen to God, there's an implication of obedience as well. So attention span has spiritual implications. Also, the, the, the prefrontal cortex where we pay attention, that area of the brain where you're paying attention, it's called executive function or executive attention. That area of the brain is also where we have self-control, where we have emotional regulation, where we have all these character development traits that we want to be having in our lives. So if we're shortening our attention spans, that's a sure sign that our prefrontal cortex is suffering, and then other areas of our spiritual and character lives are also suffering. So does God have an answer? to all this. Of course he does. Listen to this study. In Sweden, they put children in a nature playground setting like that one right there. They have them playing in the beautiful setting with greenery around them and they say, okay, now they're gonna, we're going to watch the children's attention span and behavior. They found that kids' attention span lengthened when they were put in nature. But when they were put in the identical type of playground in an urban setting, the children's attention span did not lengthen in the same way. Now another thing about attention span is Creativity, ingenuity, individual thinking requires, they say, 15 to 20 minutes of pondering something, rolling it over in your mind, and then the light bulb goes off. For the average person, it takes some time, 15 to 20 minutes. How many seconds is 15 to 20 minutes? It's a lot longer than eight seconds. 
It's a thousand seconds. And so we need a thousand seconds, really, to, to be able to be thinkers and doers and small c creators, like it says in the book Education. And so we're going to be, if you're in the phone generation here where the phone is there all the time, 77% of people admit, when nothing is occupying my attention, well, I just grab my phone and I just look at it. I didn't go on there to do anything necessarily, but I'm all of a sudden on there and being stimulated with some app or some social media post or whatever. So the media mind is going to be more dull but the mind of Christ more creative. Listen to Dr. Nicholas Cardaris. I've worked with over a thousand teens in the past 15 years and have observed that students who have been raised on a high-tech diet not only appear to struggle more with attention and focus, but also seem to suffer from an adolescent malaise that appears to be a direct byproduct of their digital immersion. Indeed, over 200 peer-reviewed studies point to screen time correlating to increased ADHD, we covered that, screen addiction, we'll get to that, increased aggression, that's on the DVDs, depression, anxiety, even psychosis. You understand why Sean Parker, the founding president of Facebook said, God only knows what it's doing to to our children's brains. He was on this apology tour. He went public and he's like, we created this monster, this thing called social media, and the more the kids and the teens are on it, it's like God only knows what it's doing to our children's brains. You heard the, the psychiatrist who's treated thousands of teens and children. He says psychosis, ADHD, depression, anxiety, all these things are going up the more that these kids are using the media. And God, God does know what it's doing to our children's brains. Sean Parker was actually quite accurate, and God has the answer. But the media mind, we can say, is dysfunctional but the mind of Christ balanced and well. So does God have the answer to this? Listen to Dr. Victoria Dunkley. She has treated hundreds of children with previously diagnosed disorders. I mean, kids are coming in with ADHD, with DMDD, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, with depression, with anxiety, with bipolar. They don't want the pharmaceutical chemical solution. They're going to her to try something different. And what is her prescription? Well, her prescription is a 100% media abstinence for three weeks. And the results, astounding. 80% of these children with major problems have the majority of their symptoms disappear. 50% have all their symptoms disappear. That's incredible. And screen time is a contributing factor to virtually all the children she has treated. Let that sink in. By the way, get that book and give that to parents. We have that on our website, beltoftruthministries.org. It's the number one recommended resource that I have other than media on the brain and the media mind, which is you know, me speaking about these things. But as far as other people's resources go, Dr. Dunkley's Reset Your Child's Brain. It gives a practical guide, step by step, how to go through a fast, how to be sure you're, you're, you're protecting that child's frontal lobe. And it's not just the children with the diagnosed disorders that can benefit from this. She talks about how childhood can be optimized by, by, by limiting screens and doing these very things that have helped the, the children with the diagnosed disorders so much. 80% of them having the majority of their symptoms disappear. 50% of them having all their symptoms disappear. That tells us that the majority of the problems that we're seeing in children today are, are from the media because you remove media and do a total fast and most of that resolves. The media mind is not well. But the mind of Christ is healing, and that's the good news. We can be transformed by the renewing of our minds. So don't be, don't be uh, so, so overwhelmed by, man, the media is really harming children and, and all of us, because God has the answer to every one of these things. There's great hope in that. We don't need to be conformed to this world. We can be transformed by the renewing of our minds. But I've spoken with many parents who get a little anxious about, well, if I limit media time for my children, how are they going to learn to use these tech devices? Well, a dolphin learned to use an iPad. It apparently isn't that hard. A, a chimpanzee played a video game. This chimpanzee, take a look at this, he's going to scroll through his social media there. Yeah, we call it a smartphone. It's because the phone is smart and we don't have to be that smart to use it. He's literally not just watching a video, but take a look. Oh yeah, let's, let's scroll through Instagram and see, see what else is on there. A chimpanzee can use social media. I never thought I'd see the day. I mean, I guess we're pretty dumbed down if we think this is the height of human intelligence that a chimpanzee can also do it. So yeah, the kids will figure it out. These devices are so intuitive, almost too user-friendly that they become addictive. We'll talk about that in a second. But yeah, there goes the chimpanzee seeing little videos and social media about his, his society of, of chimps. But you get the idea. It's interesting that big names like, uh, like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates 
When you consult the top names, I'm talking the biggest names in tech, how did they do things with their kids? Well, you know what? Steve Jobs was asked in an interview, what do your teenagers think of the iPad? It's about to hit store shelves. It's a really big deal, right? He goes, no, my kids have never used it. But wait a minute, it's been available. Prototype versions. They haven't tried it out. You haven't done trials on them? No, we limit the devices and the technology use in our home. And it's like, whoa, I thought the Steve Jobs family would be heavy media on the cutting edge of it all. Well, Bill Gates, same thing. 45 minutes of internet use per day, max. Evenings in the, in the Bill Gates house. Speaking of the thing about the, the evening screen use time and the blue light, there was a set time in the evening that Bill Gates' family was like, it, no, no media use at all after a set time. Another Silicon Valley engineer I read about in, a, in an article in the New York Times about how all these tech people seem to be doing less media, not more, with their children. He has a timer in the power outlet that gives power to the Wi-Fi router, and, and the timer cuts off power to their internet at seven o'clock. So the family is internet free after seven o'clock in the evening. The current CEO of Apple says, I don't want my nephew on a social network. So again, these are the biggest names. Adam Alter, the author of Irresistible, tells in his book of several video game designers that he spoke with personally that said, these video games are so addictive, we ourselves won't even play them, let alone the children. Alex Constantinople, chief executive at the Outcast Agency, a tech firm, has zero screen time for her five-year-old. For her older children, it's very limited, 30 minutes per day. And it's not just the big names and the executives. You get the engineers at Yahoo and Google and eBay and the, the 20-somethings and the young adults and the millennials. And you figure millennials are so into tech and it's like all media all the time and we're going to have all our kids on it. Not the workers in these tech firms. The guys who are producing the media, are their children are very protective. In interviews, and you can see this in the New York Times article, Dark Consensus About Screens Emerges, and they say things like, like, well, you know, we have nannies and our nannies have to sign a contract that they will not have our, our three-year-olds on, on devices and the nanny won't be on, on, on them either. You're going to play, you're going to do real things. The most sought after private school to send their kids to is called the Waldorf School of the Peninsula. And this is a school where children are doing pencil and paper, chalkboards, gardening, zero screen time, zero educational technology. I'll talk more about that in disc five of the media mind, people of the book in the age of the app. Book reading and literacy is so important and screens are, are disrupting that so that the tech people in Silicon Valley are sending their children to the most sought after school is the one that's media free until middle school or even high school. Here's Sherry Turkle at MIT. She's surrounded by super techies and the same story here on the East Coast. She says everybody's at a Montessori school and has rules about no computers at the dinner table, no computers at breakfast, no computers here, no computers there, no computers in the classroom. I mean, same story. So you get the idea. What do they know that we don't know? Well, these two guys knew a little something about how to protect a certain time of the day and, and keep that preserved as family time. And you know what time that was? It was mealtime. They both spoke in their interviews. Mealtime is very protected in our home. No devices and everybody comes to the meal together and we have meaningful conversations. It's kind of like this restaurant that put a sign up on their door. We do not have Wi-Fi. Talk to each other. Pretend it's 1995. <laughs> Penn State University studied romantic dates and you go on a date with your significant other. They found the majority of people say that the phone disrupts their, their time together most of the time, usually is the word. It usually interrupts our date and our meal together. That's a sad thing, right? And they, they called it technoference. And the more technoference there was in the relationship, the lower the relationship satisfaction was. No surprise there, right? Because you're not paying attention to each other. And even in the home, the same thing. University of Michigan study found what they called tension increase in the homes of today because of parental use of the phone and, and tension between parent and children. And they said it contaminated the home environment. So does God have the answer to this? Deuteronomy 6, Psalm 128, verse 3. You know what both of these talk about? Many people don't think about it because you don't, you don't notice it at first, but in Deuteronomy 6, it says, parents, talk about the word of God with your children as you rise up and lie down, as you walk by the way, and as you sit. Now, where do we sit together? Up and down, that's morning and evening worship. Walk by the way, that's just kind of doing life together. We sit together at mealtime, which is referred to in Psalm 128, verse 3. The children will rise up like olive plants, round 
about our tables. Our tables are where the children are being raised and coming to an understanding of the health message and manners and mealtime etiquette and, and just social conversation and, and spiritual, meaningful conversations. The Steve Jobs family, they didn't even, these are secular people. How much more for us when we have the biblical injunction, the biblical requirement that we pass on these truths to our children. But the devil knows this. He's got an attack prepared. But this know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. Notice this part. Disobedient to parents. And notice the other underlined part. Without natural affection. So you get a situation in the last days where there's an assault on the family. And the devil is up to no good. Jesus even predicted this when he said, There will be two against three and three against two in the household. In Luke 12, he spoke of the very divided home that Paul in 2 Timothy is speaking of there. Natural affections where you think you'd normally be coming together. And it's the one place we can all love one another and accept one another and spend time together. Well, today, children spend twice as long on smartphones as talking to parents. And parents spend twice as much time just on Netflix alone than on all their uh, time, quality time with their children. So you add up all the media use and it's even more, but twice as much Netflix as quality time with their children. Half of families text each other now in the same house. Experts say tech craze could have a catastrophic effect on family life. So the media mind alone, but the mind of Christ connected, connected with each other, because God has the answer to this. In Malachi 4, it says, In the last days, just before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, the hearts of the children and the hearts of the fathers will turn toward each other. They're, they're turned away to begin with in the last days, as we saw. Two against three, three against two. Natural affections waning. And, but, but, but the good news is, you can fulfill this prophecy in your own lives, with your loved ones, with your family, with your friends. The hearts of the fathers and the hearts of the children will turn toward each other again in the last days. That, I want to fulfill that good prophecy right there. But the sad reality is, the average parent is doing what they call continuous partial attention. So their little children are there, they're doing their thing. Mom or dad is over here, we're busy doing this, and we're giving them kind of attention. Continuous, partial attention. And injuries for children under five are up 12%. And you're like, wait a minute, haven't we gotten like ultra super obsessive about safety in this, in this at present age? How are injuries up 12%? We're so distracted over here, the little ones. I confess, I even almost really messed up. I got up in the morning, got on my phone to check the weather for the day. And my little baby's crawling on the ground there. Cool, okay, I'll pick her up in just a sec. I'm on here, I'm on here. I look over, she's crawling toward the cabinet where my wife had laid down mouse traps the night before. And I'm like, ah, I picked the little baby girl up and just saved her in time. But foolish of me, here I am on my phone, oblivious to what's going on over here. It's not quite as bad as this one, though. A Korean couple let a baby die die when they played a video game. They were raising a fairy baby in the video game, in a sim game, a simulated fake reality, a counterfeit reality. That's what media becomes for so many of us. It's another place we go and live. And in extreme cases, we totally check out to the world around us, even a crying baby who's dying of malnutrition, not getting sufficient uh, calories from mother's milk. 12 hours the baby went without being nursed and ended up dying. Now, I know that's an isolated case. There's not like a massive rise in, in that, but injuries are up and just in general ignoring the children is up and they get a little amygdala reaction, a little anxiety alarm hits their brain when they seek attention of mother. Mommy or daddy, look at the rock I found or look at the Lego thing I made and we're like, oh, interesting, like partial attention continuously. Then they, they don't, th those bids for attention go unmet and, it, and it, it really wounds their mind and their brain in a very real, real way. Even dogs might get depressed when owners over use smartphones, the study says. So if we want screens and spiritual development to be in the same world, what we need to do is think about the number one factor for children to accept the spiritual truths that the parents are laying down. You want to know what the number one? I, I could go through 50 of them. Go to beltoftruth.tv, view the Raising the Remnant series. I won't do all 50 right now. The number one factor 
for children accepting the spiritual truths that the parents are, are teaching is that those truths are taught in an atmosphere of relational warmth and connectedness. Not continuous partial attention, but true oneness and, and secure attachment and closeness. That's the number one thing. I, and when they don't have that closeness, when they don't have that facial contact, when we are on our phones like this and they're looking at us and that's the face they see, or the kids are on their devices, we'll talk about that in a second, what happens is they're not developing social and emotional intelligence. You ask anybody in childcare and in teaching today, I had a room full of teachers and I asked them, how many of you have seen kids' social skills, language skills, conversation skills, emotional intelligence go down in recent years? Every hand went up. Of all the teachers are like, oh yeah, we've seen that. I spoke with a, 50, uh, a veteran of 50 years in, in daycare. This lady was a daycare provider for 50 years. I said, what's the biggest change of all? She's like, conversation, eye contact, social, verbal, uh, all of that. The emotional intelligence stuff they're really, kids are really struggling with because parents are on their devices, and as we'll say in just a second, kids are on theirs as well. But does God have the answer to this? UCLA study of children going into nature. Even before I tell you about children's screen time, I gotta tell you about the answer to it. These kids were given five days of media free time in nature, in a, in a, in a, a camp setting. They were doing games, they were doing challenges, they were doing team building activities, hiking, archery, you name it. No media, nature, and socializing in a positive way. And you know what they found? In just five days, their emotional intelligence scores were increasing. And socially they were improving and more empathy and love. That is a beautiful thing. Just five days of no media. It took Victoria Dunkley three, sometimes four weeks to get those kids to really come out of the doldrums of depressive and emotional regulation problems and attention problems and all that. But you can start seeing a comeback in just five days. Now the sad reality is when, when, our, when we as parents are on our devices so much, I got to give you the, the, the statements of the children from Dr. Katherine Steiner Adair in The Big Disconnect where she, taught, she actually interviewed children about how their children feel about their parents' media use. I want you to hear the quotations of the children and hear the heart cry of those kids. Here's Colin, age 12. There are definitely some parts that make it seem like my parents are really addicted to their phones. And I feel like my dad is with his computer, definitely. I mean, if he's like awake at one, he'll check on the dog and then he'll look at his computer and be on it till like five, till like five in the morning and think it was like five minutes. And then the next day, he's really tired. Angela, age 13, says, what I wish my parents understood is that technology isn't the whole world. It's annoying because it's like you also have a family. How about we just spend some time together? And they're like, wait, I need to just check on something on my phone. I need to call work and see what's going on. Carlos, age 13, says, when they're on the computer or something, it's always like they're entranced by it. They are addicted to it, and they just do it all the time. Tyler, age seven, says, my mom is almost always on the iPad at dinner. She's always just checking. Penny, age seven, says, I always keep on asking her, let's play, let's play. And she's always texting on her phone. Owen, age nine, says, once my dad was ignoring my mom so bad for like 30 minutes, so I sat on his keyboard. I got sent to my room. I was just trying to help my mother. I got in trouble, though. Ava, age 11. I'm sorry, age 7. <clears throat> A lot of time at home, when my parents are home and on their computers, I feel like I'm not there because they pretend like I'm not there. They're not even talking to me. They're just ignoring me. I feel like, ugh, sad. Annabelle, age seven, says, my parents are always on their computers and on their cell phones. It's very, very frustrating and I get lonely inside. When my dad is on the phone, I have this conversation in my head. Hello, remember me? Remember who I am? I am your daughter. You had me because you wanted me. Only it doesn't feel like that right now. Right now it feels like all you care about is your phone. But I don't say that because they'll get mad at me. It doesn't help. It feels worse. So it's just the conversation I have with myself. You can imagine if we feel that pain of those children, how does the infinitely empathetic God of heaven 
who in our affliction, he is afflicted, it says in Isaiah, he must absolutely feel that the children's voices are crying out in this age of neglect, in this age of media addiction. God has a plan and is designed for our children to make their lives as happy as possible. That's a direct quote from the book Child Guidance. Make their lives as happy as possible. They can be free as lambs running outdoors, but the disappearance of childhood is upon us. 40 years ago, Neil Postman wrote the book Disappearance of Childhood. Kids are glued to TV screens and they're not playing and there's not so much time with parents and nature and labor and books and normal childhood stuff. He was prophetic with that, wasn't it? Wasn't he? Today we have a third of childhood in desks, a third of childhood in screens, and a third of childhood sleeping with negligible amounts for anything else. It's criminal in the sight of heaven. The last child in the woods revealed that the majority of children in surveys admit that they have never climbed a tree before. And these are 11-year-olds. And the, the majority of them have never been out climbed a tree. And a third of them that had climbed a tree, I'm sorry, the, the ones who, many of the ones who had climbed a tree said that when they were up there, they were just thinking about getting back to their media and playing their video games. Then the interviewers asked the children, would you like to go to the park? Every kid wants to go play at the park. A third of them were totally uninterested. Well, only a third of them were interested. Only a third. Two thirds of them were totally uninterested in going to the park. So kids' media use today, the average child, 6 to 16, spends twice as long just on video games as all outdoor activities combined. By age seven, the average child will have spent as much time in viewing media as an entire year of their lives. I mean, it's just so out of control. The, the average two to five year old is doing four hours of screen time per day, getting them away and into nature and they start to come alive. This clip you're gonna see is like children coming alive, but it's at the very end. You gotta go through some nostalgia and joy and then through like a, oh, whoa, crisis for the current kids. And then you'll see the hope at the end. Enjoy this clip. When you were a kid, what did you do for fun? So we'd go blueberry picking, for instance. Uh, just, that's so cute. <laughs> but it was true. We grew watermelons, um, plantains. I found an old sign, which was big enough for me to sit on. It made a great toboggan. It was very slick and very fast. <laughs> I had a few fish in my basket, and I looked up on this bluff, and here's this black bear sitting there watching me. If he starts chasing me, I'm going to keep throwing the fish out of my basket until he's gorged and he won't, and he won't bother me. And what did you like to do for fun? Just, you know, you go door to door, get a group of kids and you play uh, lots of games, uh, hide and seek, just going out to the field and playing baseball. And we build these massive forts, you know, the kind that you can actually sit in and, and, and play in, you know, with, with our friends and it was just really wonderful. So what do you like to do for fun? Video games, definitely. I like to go on my phone, text, some email. My favorite thing to do in the world is definitely watching videos and playing video games. Those take up so much of my time. Three hours, or t three to four hours a day. Same. Five hours straight. Just last week, I watched 23 episodes of a TV series in less than four days. I forget. I'm in a house, I have parents, I have a sister, I have a dog, I... Just think I'm in the video game, I completely get lost. I would die if I don't have my tablet. Whenever I feel upset, I'd play video games and I'd feel normal. It's really wonderful. When your daughters grow up, your great-great-grandkids, what do you think will happen if this trend continues? It's scary to think that they'll never have to leave the house. Cindy grew up uh, doing a lot of the things that I did and, and enjoyed. And I see what uh, my grandsons are doing today, and it's, uh, it's mind-boggling. By the time they have kids, it's going to be a really different environment. I actually feel a little sad because I feel like he's missing out on what's out there mm -hmm. in the beautiful world. special connection with nature. I think it's innate in all children, but needs to be nurtured. 
We can say definitely that the media mind is immersed in the counterfeit reality. I mean, you heard those kids, they think it's normal. This is like, I have a sister and a dog and a mother and I'm totally lost in my media. Immersed in the counterfeit reality, the mind of Christ awake to the wonders of God's reality. The media mind enclosed in a virtual prison. Did you know that the average child spends less time outdoors than prison inmates spend outdoors? I say this is criminal in the sight of heaven. The children aren't the criminals here, but they're in a virtual prison. Maybe we're the criminals for letting it happen. The mind of Christ, though, fully alive. Did you see the kid with the water coming down and running through the woods? It's like, yes, coming alive as they're in nature. They experience the presence of Jesus when they do it with parents especially and family and friends and, and mentors and human beings. I mean, they're now talking about social robots teaching children emotional intelligence and social skills because we're all so busy and the preschool teacher has 30 of these kids they're trying to juggle and they can't possibly pour into each one. And then by the time they get to be young adults, we have the most narcissistic generation ever recorded because of all of these problems of mental health from childhood. And I'll tell you something, I read recently the average millennial will take take 25,000 selfies during their lifetime. I mean, there's no sin in a picture of yourself with uh, beautiful nature or somebody else with you or whatever, but 25,000 selfies is an awful lot. I'll take 100 just to get it just right for my Instagram post so I get the look right because it's such narcissism. Growing number of selfie wrist injuries. More than 200,000 teens had plastic surgery and social media had a lot to do with it. 200,000, 229,000 teens, plastic surgery in one year year. And then it's also insecurity though. Social media addicts are more likely to feel inadequate. So is it narcissism or is it insecurity? You might be like, well, hmm, those are like opposites. Narcissism says, puffing me up, look how great I am. Everybody look at me. Self, you know. But, but it's the other side of the self coin is self-loathing and self-deprecation and, and, and insecurity and all of these feeling inadequate and that kind of stuff is, is the devil's way of pressing people down. He is the accuser. By the way, God comes to you and says, no, you want to know what your value and your worth is? I mean, it's this simple. What is your value? What is your worth? It is, how is it measured? It's in the life of Christ who gave himself for you. And that is of infinite value. He would have died even just for one soul who was lost. Leaving the 99 sheep going for the one. There is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. And there were moments where he was on that cross not seeing himself, foreseeing that coming forth from the portals of the tomb. The darkness enshrouded him. The father turns his face away. And wounds which mar the chosen one bring many souls to glory. And we go, wow, praise God for that. The gospel message tells me I am beloved of God and I have been saved if I will just repent and receive that forgiveness and stand up out of the muck and mire. He's saying, you matter to me. You are my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. When that was said to Jesus at the baptism, you are my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. That's spoken to us also because Jesus was not ashamed to call us brethren and he invites us to be joint heirs with him, with the same father. He's in the human race now. We are brethren. He is the sinless one, but we receive his righteousness as a free gift. So the father says to us the same, you are my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. That is incredible good news. I love it. The media mind though is narcissistic and insecure. But the mind of Christ, when you hear that gospel message, we become secure in Christ. Now the accuser has social media ready to push down our self-worth. You saw social media addicts are feeling more insecure. Part of it is a deliberate scheme. There were leaked documents that came out of Facebook in Australia a couple years ago, and Facebook advertising personnel were bragging to the advertisers that we can read people's emotions. We can find when they're, when they're in a vulnerable state and when they're feeling low self-worth, the young people particularly, and then you can target your advertising. I mean, that's insidious. That's nefarious. That's why the founding president of Facebook apologized for it. And he's like, 
we were exploiting a vulnerability in human psychology. When we invented social media, those are his words. He says we were deliberately exploiting a vulnerabilities in human psychology. And you might say, wow, that is something I don't wish on any teen. Well, that's what Jean Twenge, who studied teens in great depth, she found after social media was invented, feelings of low self-worth skyrocketed like never before. And she says that this generation is totally unprepared for adulthood as well. It's an infantile type of infantilizing of a generation. 18-year-olds now act like 15-year-olds used to, and 13-year-olds like 10-year-olds used to. So the media mind is, is in a state of arrested development with so much social media and, and online activity. But the mind of Christ is maturing properly. But when we put iPads in our baby's hands and give them the iPod-y, and if you've probably seen that one in a previous session I've done, when, when, you, when you give them the uh, iPad activity seat, you know, the babies for newborns, and, and all the way from the earliest age on up, you, what you're doing with those children is you're, you're divorcing them from the three-dimensional non-virtual world and plugging them into the virtual, and then they don't know how to operate, like you saw with the magazine, right? And they do a block stacking app on the, on the, on the iPad, and then they have no idea how to stack real blocks because they learn nothing according to the top research on, researchers on that, Dimitri Christakis and others. So children today, not toilet trained when they start school. Wow, two thirds of teachers who were interviewed said they are worried that children know how to swipe a phone but don't have a clue about much else. Kids use so much tech today they can't hold a pencil anymore, doctors say. Children learn to tie shoelaces later than ever before. More kindergartners know how to tie and know how to use a smartphone app than you tie their own shoelaces. And it's not just the fine motor skills. Yes, tying shoelaces is hard for little kids. But gross motor skills, you're like running, jumping, going down slides and stuff. Gross motor skills are down for kids today and core muscles are weaker and playground injuries are up. Now, wait a minute. Playgrounds are definitely way safer. The old days, right? The slide, man, that was a blast. You'd be like 10 feet in the air coming down. The merry-go-round, woo hoo hoo your feet are hanging out the back and it was like the playground equipment decades ago it wasn't that safe but today it's like six inches of mulch or rubber on the ground and like padding everywhere and slides that are like four feet tall playgrounds are way more safe today but playground injuries are up because kids aren't running and playing and doing things to test their abilities and they don't they just aren't navigating the three-dimensional the non-virtual the real actual world like we used to, and so they're not learning those skills. And even older kids, but young people, young adults, medical students raised on screens lack skills for surgery. Roger Kneebone, professor of surgical education at Imperial College London said that a decline in hands-on creative subjects at school and practical hobbies at home means that students often do not have a basic understanding of the physical world. They don't even have a basic understanding of the physical world. That's incredible. I spoke with an auto mechanics professor, a teacher a while back at a high school. He said, I used to be able to get 50% at least of my students up to competence at auto mechanics in just one year of my class. And they, they would be on to their way, you know, learning some more things, tinkering and be able to work on their own cars. He says, today I'm lucky if I get 12 to 15% of them to that, to that level. And it's just a, it's a different age with so much screen time. And what Dr. Maggie Jackson says is video games teach the kinds of skills useful for playing more video games and not much more. So when these guys go to the rehab for video game addiction outside of Seattle, the, the, the creator, the founder of this, this institute called Restart Program, she said, you'd, you'd be amazed how many of these 20-something men don't know how to make breakfast, clean a bathroom. It's like they've been playing video games since they were kids and they're, it's infantile, it's the arrested development of the generation, even into adulthood, and to the point where now one quarter of young men in their early 20s are not working. They're, they're not, not employed, a quarter of young men. And that's like the most employed section of the country. I, I talked about this in Media on the Brain, Disc 5. Look at that at beltoftruth.tv. It's called The Demise of Guys. The devil really wants to uh, assault the, 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 the strength of, of, of young men and that, that energy. I mean, you got, you're at your prime there, right, in your 20s. A quarter of them are playing video games full time. So the media mind is lacking practical skills, from the children to the youth on up to the adults. The mind of Christ, well-rounded. Let's go back to the teens. The percentage of teens, according to Jean Twenge in her book, iGen, the percentage of teens that have a job has been cut in half. The average teen now gets less exercise than the average 60-year-old. They're studying less, they do less volunteer work, 
they do fewer extracurricular activities, and they're getting their driver's licenses later than ever before. Still a quarter of them, still by the time they're seniors in high school, do not yet have their driver's license. So what's happening where 18-year-olds are like 15-year-olds, where 10-year-olds are like 13-year-olds, where, where it, it's, a lot of it is the social media, because you get on there and you're not living real life, you're not getting out and doing things, which there's a silver lining in some of the iGen stuff actually. Promiscuity is down. Alcohol consumption with teens is down. Which would be really good news if they were doing something great with their lives, but you're in your bedroom on your phone and uh, taking cues from each other. And it's this groupthink mindset where you're just like wanting to fit into the social media conformity. Don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your minds. And it, it, one thing that really blew my mind was the Tide Pod craze where they're following the example of eating laundry detergent. And there were actual medical organizations that had to put out statements because this became such a trend. And they were like, we do not recommend the practice of eating laundry detergent. Tide Pods are not meant for human consumption. Consumption. This is toxic. To, like, no kidding. We have to actually say that. And throughout history, you've had groupthink and mob psychology set in, and people end up with witch hunts and racial lynchings and, 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 and movements of, of Nazism and, and you name it, just people losing their head. And that's social media setting us up for that very same thing, by the way. The whole world wonders after the beast. We'll talk about that manipulation in just a second. But the love of most is definitely growing cold. Empathy dropped 40% in college students since the year 2000. Empathy, meaning love and caring about people. You're, you're much less likely to care about somebody when you're only seeing a part of them in the social media or in the video game world than if you're in person and you see their face and you hear their voice and all of that nonverbal communication stuff. That is most of what communication is. You're missing out on that in, in the virtual world. But then even just having the phone sitting there. In one study, they had pairs of people have a little social engagement, get to know each other a little. And strangers come in, sit at a table and talk. And, and then they, they had their phone sitting there, not to be used, just to sit there. And then another group of people, they were over here and they had a notebook sitting on the table, no phone allowed. They found that the two groups interacted differently. This group had a lower level of trust, bond, interest in the other, empathy. This one had a higher social bond. And it's like, wow, even the presence of our phones is disrupting this. The media mind, cold, the mind of Christ, caring. And this is why the former Facebook executive feels tremendous guilt for what he helped make. He's another one like Sean Parker who came out with an apology to her. He says, I feel tremendous guilt. We are ripping apart the social fabric of how society works. That's a strong statement. He's like, social media, by the way, we're, we're doing four times more social media than socializing. For every one hour that we're with people, we're four hours on social media. And teens would rather just chat their friends than be with them. That really surprised me to see a generation that's like two-thirds of them, two-thirds of them say, when it comes to my close friends, I'd rather just go online and be with them on, and on Snapchat or on Instagram or whatever than actually get together with the people that, that I care about the most, my friends. The media mind disconnected, but the mind of Christ affectionate. Former Surgeon General sounds the alarm on the loneliness epidemic. Nearly half of Americans now report that they sometimes or always feel alone. Loneliness for teens jumped 31% in just five years after the advent of the smartphone and social media. A full 25% of Americans admit in surveys that they have zero close confidants in their lives, in their life. That's double the amount from the 1980s. The number of people you can turn to for social support has dropped 33% in recent years. So when the Bible says it is, not, it is not good for man to be alone, God's created us to be social creatures, to love him, love our neighbor as ourselves. These are the two great commands. And, and it's like, you know what? God says, even if father or mother forsake us, even if we don't have families, the Lord will take us up, the Bible says. He will be there for us. And we are to be there for each other as well. In Hebrews 10, it says, don't neglect assembling together. Church attendance. I mean, there's so many social and health benefits from that, not to mention salvation by walking with the Lord and going to church and maintaining that faith in Christ. God's methods are working for people who are doing them. In fact, this study showed if you just limit 
um, social media to 30 minutes a day, loneliness scores drop. So you become less lonely by doing very little social media. A Denmark study showed if people fast from social media completely for one week, you get loneliness scores dropping 36%. So social media is definitely causing more loneliness and getting off of it or limiting it to very little is increasing our social lives and capacities. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Hebrews 10, 25. The media mind, lonely. The mind of Christ is fulfilled. Now it becomes really destructive for teens, for young teens, especially girls. Look at these statistics. After holding steady for decades, immediately after the advent of social media, I almost call it suicide media. Teen suicide rose by 70% in just 10 years. Among age 10 to 14, the rate went up 133%. Among 12 to 14 year old girls, suicide went up threefold. This is a very toxic thing for most teens. Anxiety is up. Why are more American teenagers suffering anxiety? Why are they more stressed, just as stressed as adults? Why has depression gone up 60% in just a six year period of time in the previous decade? This is social media that's causing this and video games. But the big thing, it was the smartphone and social media that came in about 2010 in a major way, 2008. But you started seeing everybody getting on it and phew, depression rates are flying up through the roof. And it's not just diagnoses of depression. These are surveys they did using the diagnostic criteria in an objective way. So not just it's become more trendy for people to seek mental health professionals, but they're just looking at objective numbers, 60% rise for teenagers and for adults. More research says Facebook can cause depression, this time among millennials. Mental health issues increased significantly in young adults over the last decade. You look at college campuses, one in four college students now has a mental health condition that they have been diagnosed, a quarter of them. And you ask mental health professionals on the college campuses, like how is, how is the counseling office going? They're go, we are overwhelmed, we are inundated, we can't handle all the demand, these kids are really struggling, and right after the advent of the smartphone and social media, boom, everything Things skyrocketed. Every one of them will tell you that same thing. We even get smartphone loss anxiety disorder. What? That's a real thing? Yes. People who lose their smartphone, it hits them. Sherry Turkle found this at MIT. It hits them emotionally like the death of a loved one. I mean, we've got millennials that would rather give up hot water and daylight than give up internet connection. As far as quality of life measures go, they value internet connection above hot water and daylight. I mean, we've got so much no-mo-phobia happening, the, happening, the fear of not having your mobile phone. 66% of people suffer from no-mo-phobia no at some point. And, and they, they say in, in London, they did a study of Londoners, a survey, and they have a greater fear of losing their phone than of dying of a terrorist attack. As if you would die from not having your phone? Well, people feel like they're gonna die. Look at these, these stats of cortisol rising. The white one is heavy, heavy phone users. The longer they're away from their phone, the more cortisol and stress they feel. It's just like worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. Moderate daily phone users even have a spike and a remaining elevated of cortisol in the yellow there. So the media mind depressed, anxious, stressed, more inclined to be suicidal, particularly for teenagers, especially teenage girls, the mind of Christ, content, joyful, and peaceful. And speaking of getting out of that depression, these same studies, the University of Pennsylvania and the Denmark study found, when you limit social media to 30 minutes or eliminate it entirely for one week, decreases in depression, increases in happiness, less sadness, anger, and you know, those types of negative emotions. Specifically, there was a 33% drop in depression for the Denmark study. <laughs> That's awesome, right? Get off of social media for most people and you're gonna feel a lot better. Former Facebook executive said, you don't realize it, but you are being programmed. So it's not just a mental health issue. What he's getting at here is, look, this is something that is programming your mind. You are not in control of your thoughts. When you are subjected to big tech's manipulation, big tech, the Facebooks and the Googles of the world, they are doing what Edward Bernays only could have dreamed of. If you haven't watched uh, disc two of Media on the Brain, get on beltoftruth.tv and view that or get the DVDs at beltoftruthministries.org. That one right there goes into the history of propaganda and mind manipulation. Edward Bernays, hugely important. Huge, they admit it. It's like, we're going to control the group mind and they won't even know about it. That's a direct quote. But now big tech says, 
Okay, we built this thing. We're on our, our apology tour here. And we're telling you, people, you don't realize it, but you are being programmed. Sean Parker said, our goal there was to give them a little dopamine hit to keep them on the platform longer, contributing more content. So they designed it to give people a dopamine hit. He goes, the inventors, the creators of social media, it's me, it's Mark Zuckerberg, it's Kevin Systrom on Instagram, it's all these people understood this consciously and we did it anyway. He's like, shame on us, we're sorry. This is the inventor of the Facebook like button. He's apologized for inventing that because he said it's messed with people so much, delivered so much dopamine, made it so addictive because you want the approval, you crave the likes. And he says, no, uh, he has no social media on his phone at all. You know, if you're thinking about practical tips and ways to try to cage these things and, and, and make media a tool that we are using media instead of media using us, I don't want to get owned. I don't want to be programmed. I want to make sure if I'm going to use social media, I, I maybe do something like he did, or at least turn off the non essential notifications so it's not constantly buzzing at us but there's always the temptation to go on there and now I'm scrolling for 45 minutes and I didn't even realize it the infinite scroll that keeps me going and going and going that was invented also to keep us engaged and keep us on the platform for longer and longer and longer but but long before the like button um, long before Facebook or even MySpace, there was the social media of the 90s remember this one Oh, the sound of dial-up. Yes. What is that sound? Okay, and then the moment comes. Did I get any mail? Did I get it? Did I? You've got mail. Yeah. Dopamine galore, yes, it's social media circa 1996, and it's like, oh, you see the picture of the guy, and then he's going forward, and then he's together with other people. America, online, we're together. You might think social media is only a new thing. I was on there as a teenager chatting until all hours of the night. So teens, I'm not judging anybody. I regret it. I say don't do that and it's a waste of time. I should have been sleeping and it was foolish. But I'll tell you something. I know from experience, this was my gateway to the internet. Maybe my gateway drug to the dopamine hit of all of the online stuff. Today, I'm not much into social media, but the study today of more than 400 8th and 11th graders found that many teenage texters had a lot in common with compulsive gamblers, including losing sleep because of texting, problems cutting back on texting, and lying to cover up the amount of time they spent texting. So whether it's Snapchat or all the way back to AOL and, and, and uh, chatting online, these things can become majorly addictive. And, and by the way, the kids who didn't understand that sound, that, 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 that was dial-up, that was a modem, and that's how we used to get online. But the you've got mail, that was such the moment. It was like the like button of the 1990s. But today we're being manipulated. This is James Williams. He created one of the most important advertising metrics in the history of the internet. One day at work, he was sitting there and he goes, look at this screen, look at this display. See these charts? These, that's a million people right there that through our advertising systems, we just kind of nudge them and, 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 and move them to do something they wouldn't have otherwise done. A million people I just caused to do something. And he started to feel like, is this for their best interest? Am I, am I doing what's right? And he's now become the critic of the largest, most standardized, and most centralized form of attention control in human history. Think about how Satan can use that to conform the minds of the masses. It's the largest, most centralized form of attention control in human history to get everybody thinking what he wants us to think. So does God have an answer to all this? Oh, by the way, there's a lot more on that stuff in disc number four, Digital Pharmacia. I just had to cut and surgically remove and amputate tons to get it down into this little uh, overview session. But it's like, no, there's so much more to say. But um, there, just, just view the whole series. God has an answer to this. This is a heavy session about addiction. I'm about to give you even more quotes. But before I give them to you, remember that when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall raise up a standard against him. And remember that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And remember that when we, we can be not slaves to sin, but slaves to righteousness. So there's so much hope when Jesus says, whom the Son sets free, he is free indeed. So we can be freed from the manipulation, freed from the addiction, and as we were talking about earlier, freed from all of this, freed from the, the, the psychological and emotional problems that so much media use is causing us at all 
all ages, and we can say, yes, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who liveth in me. So this is Dr. Peter Wybrow, Director of Neuroscience at UCLA. He calls screen time electronic cocaine. Chinese researchers use the term digital heroin. Dr. Andrew Doan, head of addiction research for the Pentagon, says that it is digital pharmakia. That's where I got the name from. Pharmakia is Greek for sorcery or for drug use. Dr. Cardara says, we now know that those iPads, smartphones, and Xboxes are a form of a digital drug. Recent brain imaging research is showing that they affect the brain's frontal cortex, which controls executive functioning, including impulse control, in exactly the same way that cocaine does. He calls it a digital drug. Ian Bogos, the famous video game creator, says that these habit-forming technologies are the cigarettes of this century. So the media mind, addicted. The mind of Christ, though, free. So don't let those scriptures leave the mind. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Whom the Son sets free, he will be free indeed. But your kid's brain on Minecraft looks like a brain on drugs. No wonder we have a hard time peeling kids from their screens and find our little ones agitated when their screen time is interrupted. Brain on drugs. You remember that phrase? There were commercials back in the day. You had the egg in the frying pan. Hey, kids, this is your brain. This is your brain on drugs. Any questions? It was like, whoa, it was this ominous sounding voice with this new to scary music. And the 60s and 70s had just happened, right? And they wanted to protect the kids of the 80s and the crack cocaine epidemic was happening. And I would go to the dime store and I would get the candy cigarettes and open the package. And in the top, it would say, candy cigarettes, I know this is ironic. It would say, say no to drugs. I was hearing it everywhere. Say no to drugs. Say no to drugs. The chapel speaker would come in and he'd go, hey kids, I'm from the 60s and I listened to the rock music and we did the drugs and you shouldn't do drugs. What was I going to say? I don't remember. And it was like, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to have that happen to me. I never did hard drugs. I did some rebellious stuff. I wasn't a very nice teenager at times playing in the rock band and, you know, acting like a fool. But I wouldn't touch hard drugs because I knew that you could get addicted. <clears throat> Where is the public service campaign for children and youth and all of us today about media addiction? I don't see the commercials with the egg and the, you know, this is your brain on video games. Your brain on Minecraft looks like a brain on drugs, he said. Oh, but that's an innocent game. You know, we're not playing violent video games. I'm telling you something. When you talk to parents, they'll tell you the same thing. It's so hard to peel kids from their screen time, right? Especially interactive screen time. And, uh, you know, if you view the whole series, you'll get a sense of maybe what kinds of media at what ages might be appropriate. But... Just, I won't get into that right now just because we don't have time. I will say this, 83% of kids have a gaming console in their home. I don't remember ever 83% of kids having cigarettes or alcohol or drugs in their lives. So to overcome this, look at this series, A Greater Less. I wanted to put the image up on the screen because it's such a peaceful, nice looking thing to go, wow, we can be enslaved to purity in a pornographic world. We can be enslaved, addicted to righteousness. We can become slaves to righteousness in an age of media addiction. And that is such good and hopeful news that I never want us to lose because thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we can form new habits. We can try new things. Now, before I tell you about trying new things, I've got to give you one more slide, one more quotation, one more piece of information here. That is awesome. I love this article in the Atlantic Magazine. Has the smartphone destroyed a generation? Well, first of all, Jean Twenge goes into it and she says, she shows how happiness levels are diminished by use of social media. So it's not that unhappy people are going to the social media, but the more social media you, people use, the less happy they are. And so we, that was shown in the Denmark and the Penn State study, too, that we talked about. But then she also shows the Monitoring the Future survey. And this has tracked kids, how they spend their time, teenagers, how they spend their time for many decades going back. And also asks them about their happiness level and gives them mental health scores. It's a massive survey. It's done, you know, a million teens over the, over the decades. So she says the results of this study could not be clearer. Teens, and this would apply to all of us, too. Teens who spend more time than average on screen activities are more likely to be unhappy. And those who spend more time than average on non-screen activities are more likely to be happy. There's not a single exception. All screen activities are linked to less happiness. And all non-screen activities are linked to more happiness. That's awesome. If you were going to give advice for a happy adolescence based on this survey, it would be straightforward. Put down the phone, turn off the laptop, and do something, anything that does not involve a screen.
And I love the emphasis on doing something else, something better. Let something better be the watchword. When you're trying to recover from something, you've got to replace it with something better. In the last three videos of the Lust series, I get into that and the overcoming principles that are hugely important. You've got to get, get, have, a, have a new habit, get addicted to a new behavior that is good and helpful. And so how do you know, though? A lot of people will look at this information and be like, yeah, those people really struggling, you know, suicidal and so depressed and anxious and, and children and ADHD and, and, and not sleeping right and yeah, so many problems. Well, I'm doing okay. I, you know, that's, 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 that's too bad for them. Well, and maybe you are. Maybe, maybe, maybe we are optimizing everything. And some people are living like the ultimate lifestyle with a health message and they're really just thriving. But I would venture to say most of us, 99% of us, um, could afford to make positive changes in our lives. And so when we get in a rut and we go, oh, you know, I, I'm okay the way I am. I don't have any major problems. I'm not so discontent that I'm going to take any radical changes. But what if God has something a little better in store for you? It reminds me of the mindset of the guy who comes into the optometrist's office. My dad was an optometrist. He had people come into the office and they would I put the instruments in front of the guy's eyes and my dad would say, all right, read that top line. Now the man coming in is like, oh yeah, I can see fine. You know, I got no problems. So he thinks. But then he reads the line. The top line is very clear. Oh, that's easy. G R M W Q. And then the next line. Okay, read that next line, please. Um, is that a C or a Q or an O or a G? Is that an F or a hashtag? Doc, I can't read that line. Okay, which one is clearer? One or two? Um, two, two, or three? Um, two, two, or four? Two is the clearest, and then he breaks it to you. Two is your new prescription. One is no lens. A little blurry, isn't it, compared to two? Whoa! Now that I have a new set of lenses to look through, I see my deficiencies. I see where I was not quite as okay as I could have been. So try something different. The Bible says, test me in these things, saith the Lord, and see if I don't open the floodgates of blessing. Taste and see that the Lord is good. I want a taste for the things of heaven. I want a taste for the word of God. And maybe in my life, not just mental health and energy and sleep and attention spans and all of that, but my spiritual life most of all, I want that to thrive. I want it to grow ever more under the perfect day. And if I've kind of planed out here, or, or maybe I'm not growing at the pace that I could, I wonder if media has something to do with it. Maybe so much entertainment, so much stimulation, so much on and off the phone, so much social media even, has made it so I'm too busy, or this becomes more boring to me. It's like the Bible is sweet as honey, sweeter than honey to our mouths, but we could get to the point where we have a distaste even for the honey. In Proverbs it says that a sated man loathes honey. I don't want to loathe the honey, loathe, hate, despise, have a distaste for it. A sated man loathes honey. If I'm sated with so much media to the point where spiritual things are not as enjoyable as they otherwise could be, and life is not as enjoyable as it otherwise could be in Christ and with others and my family and our social lives, then Lord, give me a new set of lenses to try out. I'm going to trust you that you will not withhold any good thing from me, as the Bible says. I'm going to trust you that you satisfy the desire of every living thing, because you've said that in your word. And I'm going to try one of these fasts that people talk about. I'm going to try a fast from this media, or watching that, or playing that, or being online so much. I'm going to have a set time of the day only that I you know, go on to this type of media or that type of media. And it's only going to be for this length. And before I do that, I'm going to do a total fast for a week and try something out. A total fast of X or Y or Z media. And you choose that. You set your own trial. But until we try something else, we can't say, no, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. This information is good for others. Try something out for it for yourself. I can tell you I've heard thousands of stories of speaking with people and receiving emails of the many, 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 many people who have seen media on the brain and made positive changes in their lives, and they come back saying, praise God, I'm closer to Jesus. Praise God, our family is closer. My marriage is better. I'm getting more work done. I mean, you name it. Mental health, happiness, joy, spiritual relationship with Jesus Christ, number one. When we allow media once again to be a tool that we might use it and not be used by it. I don't want to be a slave to any device of Satan, so to speak. But we can redeem the time and redeem the technologies as God designed when what hath God wrought happened 
1844, and we can use the technologies to God's glory. So go and try and test and see and taste and see that the Lord is good. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this time together. We ask that you would please give us some, some ideas of how to try something different with our media use. We pray that you would reaffirm our convictions to have zero worldly media of things that are displeasing to you from Hollywood and the music industry, just to, to throw that away, but to try a fast from these media tools in certain ways that might be disrupting our relationship with you. Give us wisdom and courage to follow through and to replace it, most importantly, Lord, with something better, with time in your nature, with time together, with time serving you and doing your work. We don't want to live lives of entertainment, Lord. We want to truly be a blessing to those around us. And not, not selfish and pleasure seeking, but seeking for the benefit of the lost and those around us. So please, please give us the power. Give us uh, the, the, the courage to step forward in this, in this trial. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.